All right, everybody, we are live for this week's show. It is for the week of August 23rd. We are almost done with the summer time, but we are still stuck inside. Welcome to our weekly show on game dev and industry topics. I'm, of course, Josh Blaser, and joining me is any game developer, Sharky. How are you doing? I'm doing good. You know, could be better, as always, but mm -hmm. things, things, are, things are starting to look up. And uh, that's a, always a good thing. Mm -hmm. I have officially one week left to finish my book, so time to get good at writing in the, in the home stretch. <laughs> time to crunch. You, you got to start putting in, you know, a mm -hmm. hundred hours a day. Exactly. And then yeah. you'll make any video game too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You got to do all that stuff on top of it. Put a hundred hours a day in. And you know, go to town every day for the next seven days. <laughs> seven days to die. Yeah. All right. <laughs> seven days to get good at writing books. Oh yes. But it's been another very interesting week in terms of the game industry. My voice is dying. <clears throat> oh, oh yeah, it's been. A, it's been a tremendous week, <laughs> and mm -hmm. not. Maybe not the best ways, but yep. You know, it's been a killer week. Especially um, if you work at Epic. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the news or the big piece that's continuing is that now Apple is going, I guess, like full vindictive mode against uh Epic. They have removed any game that makes use of the, or they're blocking games that make use of the Unreal Engine on uh, anything iOS. I, I don't think they're doing that yet, but they're 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 going to if mm -hmm. if 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 Epic doesn't drop this. They're, so they're banning the you know they're banning all developers that use Unreal Engine from the iOS store. Which if that I'm, isn't I'm, petty, I don't know what is. <laughs> Yeah, but on the other hand, I don't think there's all that many people who, who use the Unreal Engine that also puts games on the iOS store. Yeah. That's a, probably a very small portion of developers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Apple's actually making themselves look worse than, than, than it actually is. I mean, it would be different if they were blocking Unity or something because, like... I mean, when you talk about Unreal, Unreal, you know, you talk about the Unreal Sheen and everything and all that, and uh, I don't think very many mobile games are going to have that Unreal Sheen. Mm -hmm. now, the you other... know what would be interesting, though, is <laughs> if Raid Shadow Legends was made in Unreal <laughs> and it was on the iOS store. <laughs> that would be super interesting. Right there, because Raid Shadow Legends may have that, that may actually be unreal. <laughs> now, the other thing that is very interesting is that there's also reports that Apple is banning WordPress because WordPress refused to put in the ability to put ads for using it because Apple wants to make more money with the mobile version of WordPress. Hmm. Yeah, so Apple is basically... Are they pulling an EA or a Blizzard right now in terms of killing their PR? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I do know that 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 uh, Epic is 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 pushing all that, that kill PR into everybody's faces. Mm-hmm. And and that that's that that was Epic's entire you know yep. <clears throat> entire uh, theory to begin with plan to begin with is let Apple suicide themselves basically, and then let's put it let's show it to everybody you know mm -hmm. let's put it in everybody's face let's let's make this you know suicide you know Apple suicide clear to everybody and so that. Uh, you and know. they did the same thing with Sony again with you know the cross platform support on Fortnite. You know, mm -hmm. everybody else is doing it and Sony's excuse just doesn't hold water. And yeah. Is gonna be very interesting to see what's gonna happen with all this. 
Yeah, it, it'll be it'll be like you know, like I said in the last podcast, it would be I you know this is one of the few times I'm actually rooting for Epic. I mean, they what they did was absolutely you know against the rules of the store. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is the rules on the store are are uh, what would be the term? Not barbaric. Um, Manipulative. Shady. Uh, yeah, but I was thinking of another word. Um, oh. mm, I can't think of it. But anyway, the the rules are, yeah, draconian. That that's the word yeah. I'm looking for. Yeah, the rules are draconian, and you know, Google Plays isn't exactly not draconian, but it's far less than than uh, than uh, Apple's, you know, and you know, of course, Sony's and you know, Sony's got some draconic, a lot of draconic rules, and uh, all the consoles do, but there, nobody's as draconic as as Apple is. Mm-hmm. And uh, to ask, answer Matthew's question, this is my original logo. The other one was the, you know, cyberpunk fan art that somebody did for me. Yeah. <laughs> he removed all the uh, cyberpunk. He's just a normal shark now. <laughs> uh, I'm a normal super shark. <laughs> Anything else uh, news-wise that stuck out to you? Um, there is something else, and I forget what it is. Um, I, I just want to make a comment here. You know that 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 I'm expecting this in the future. I'm predicting the future, kind of thing. Is that in the future? You know, and this may already be. This is probably already happening, but. It is probably going. It's going to get worse over time. It's going to become where it's a mainstay kind of thing. People are going to, you know, say that, hey, you know, Fall Guys seceded with everything they did, and they're going to, you know, miss out on ninety percent of the stuff they did, if not ninety nine percent, and then they're, you know. And even the ones that realize that are going to be like, you know, because like Fall Guys did not do the best of job in anything because like mm -hmm. in any place, but like they, nobody does, but they could have certainly done a lot, lot better in many, many aspects. And even if you realize that, like it's like, Oh, they did it, so I can do it. And you know, just like the you know, like the Stardew Valley argument, he did it, so I can do it. No, no, you can't. <laughs> Unless you clone him, and you go back in time, you and and you insert your brain into a bottle on top of his brain, and you tie them in together. You can't do what he did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. You know, just like in the same thing goes with Fall Guys, but I think they had a whole entire team, so you would have to clone all of them, clone them, and tap into the, you know, you, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. And you got to do time travel, too. Yeah. So, like, and you it, know. You're kind of we'll, bearing the lead if you can already do time travel and cloning. <laughs> yeah. I'm seeing something popped up on Twitter about people complaining about gatekeeping with specific genres, and I don't know what any of that is about. All I see is the end of the argument. I don't see what the beginning of the argument was. I don't know. I haven't heard anything on that. And, of course, people are still talking about Marvel's, Marvel's Avengers. Is, that, is it Marvel Avengers or Marvel's Avengers? You know, is it, is it Demon Souls or Demon's Souls? Unsure. <laughs> and they're making fun of the fact that the game pauses if you don't do the QTE. 
and people are saying stupid things about that, but a lot of people don't realize QTs are horrible mechanics in games. They shouldn't be in them anymore. Yeah. I, I have this QTE-inspired system that I want to do where it's not actually QTE. It's actually, you know, live action, sort of like a Devil May Cry kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it looks beautiful like a QTE. You know, like the cameras zoom in and everything, and, you know, you get all those different camera angles and everything, and that's going to be really tricky to pull off with the controls. But there, there's something I want to do along that line, mm-hmm. you know. You know, the, the beauty of a QTE, but the playability of just, you know, mm-hmm. a fighting game, sort of like a Devil May Cry kind of thing, and I think that would be really awesome <laughs> if you could, if I could pull that off. Mm-hmm. I did watch uh, uh, Summer Games Done Quick is going on right now. I saw Night Trap for the first time. And hmm. very interesting game in terms of like the FMV layout. The fact that you're able... like I've seen some developers or some games go over you know, like you're watching multiple screens and stuff like that. It seemed like Night Trap was the first to kind of do that. Also has a 90s music montage, which, you know, every video game needs, right? Yeah, and every 90s anything yeah uh to matthew's point about yeah so dc announced a bunch of stuff there's one wait was it there's two different batman or uh dc related games coming out there's gotham knights which is i believe done by the same developer who did arkham what was it arkham origin so that was kind of the uh knockoff batman game and rocksteady is working on suicide squad which is the four-player or one-to-four-player kind of game that that is raising some red flags to me. Did you have a chance to see that? I, I, I heard about it, but I haven't seen any of it. It looks... I'm getting, like, very weird, like, Marvel Avengers uh, theme or Marvel Avenger flags from that, that you have four different characters. They're going to have... It, doesn't look like a DC game. Somebody said I remind them of Sunset Overdrive. Hmm. No idea how they're going to pull it off. I just really hope it doesn't have the same you know, loot system as Avengers. Yeah, like 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 the Avengers game. That's, in my opinion, a train wreck because like mm-hmm. there's just it. it feels like it's just some kind of generic game that somebody made and then it's like hey let's just throw the Avengers license on top of this you know mm-hmm. and it's like you know it's, it's not a good game built around the Avengers because like you take the Hulk and you, you fight these little peons and you hit them like 20 times before they go down mind you that was on max difficulty but my max difficulty for the Hulk is I, I take my pinky and I actually try, you know, mm-hmm. and I flick you, you know, for a peon, you know, like, like what would have been satisfying for Hulk is like, you, you, you have like you know enemies and then you hit them and then they go flying like off the screen kind of thing. Well, the thing and that that that's on a light hit, but you know, the the what they could have done for difficulty is just put more enemies. You know, which would have been or you know, different types of enemies. enemies. Yeah, or or stronger enemies. What they what they're doing, I was saying this on the Discord, is that it's very much following the hero collector route of you know mobile design. That instead of designing unique characters, you build everybody out of the same template, and then you just tweak little things here and there. So mm-hmm. Hulk punches just like uh, Black Widow, who punches just like Miss Marvel, who attacks just like Iron Man. And, you know, they'll get different ultimates and different passive, but, you know, it's the same It's the same song, just different beats to it. Yeah, which might work for, you know, like, different characters, but it won't work for that. Like, like I could see something like that working better, for, working decent for X-Men, because, like, Mm. You have Wolverine, he's he's human, you know, you just give him a, you know, healing buff and and a, you know, and the claws do damage kind of thing. You got Cyclops that, you know, you just give him the laser beam kind of thing. But that's because they're they're you know, for the most 
a lot of their powers, not not all of them, but a lot of their powers are just that they're human with extra stuff on top of them. We're we're like Captain America is a super soldier. He's not a human. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He started out as a human, you know, but now he's a superhuman. What they Hulk is the Hulk, you know, <laughs> like yeah. what they should have done is really play more into the ARPG side of things and, you know, make the characters like unique classes so that the Hulk would behave differently than Iron Man, who would behave differently than the other characters. I and mean, you could have you could got rid of, r- away with it with Black Widow, uh, Hawkeye, and, uh, you know, the other human characters like that. But, you know, you can't get away with that with Thor, Hulk, Iron Man... Thor's, you know, mighty hammer can't knock out a soldier in one punch. Yeah. <laughs> and to uh, Michael's point about wanting a Superman open world game, it's that same issue of, you know, how do you take a character who can probably punch through the moon and design a game around that when you can't just uh, break through everything? And well, I, I tell you how you 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 put it in a small facility, you know, tight corridors and everything, mm-hmm. and have the whole entire entire game, uh, all the walls lined with <laughs> with uh, krypton, kryptonite, brother, and that way he, he's not really all that super powered all the way through, and you can you know just do it that way. <laughs> hey, John, thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah, and make sure to fly, fly through a bunch of rings, too, as Superman. <laughs> over and over and over again. You I know, think, what about the, the Superman DDR version where you, uh, you, you, uh, you just, uh, you've got to fly through the rings in a certain order? And Thorne just described the plot of every Metroidvania game ever made. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and the problem is, again, it's kind of like the issue of how do you balance all the cool stuff that these characters can do? I mean, Hulk Golden Destruction is one of my all-time favorite open-world games. And they still had to kind of limit what you can't... You can't exactly break every building as the Hulk. <laughs> yeah. You, you... You... I don't... I don't think we have enough processing power to actually do as much as as you can do with these characters unless you just kill everything down mm-hmm. or up whichever way you would consider it basically you know kind of like a tactical RPG you know like like one block can represent an entire building kind of thing you know what I mean mm-hmm. rather than you know or one tile and you know like like four tiles would be like a you know, or maybe six tiles would be like a Walmart kind of thing. <laughs> what they need to do, somebody needs to do more with the uh, Red Faction 2 engine that allow for almost like full destructibility. Yeah, I mean, you would need that on top of that kind yeah. of thing, but like, you would, you know, like, to get the, you know, to be able to use the full destructibility without making your graphics card and CPU cry, <laughs> yeah. you're going to need to make those buildings a lot smaller kind of thing yeah. by the scaling so that each one of them is far less load on your system, hence by scaling up or down, yeah. whichever way you want to consider it. And Solution. There, I have a rant for the Avengers game with the whole loot base system that I don't think we have the time to get to today. But when the game comes out, we're going to have to have a discussion about, you know, pseudo-RPG systems. I'm actually working on a video now talking about them. Yeah. Doom Guy is you, too powerful. <laughs> Not on Nightmare, you know, isn't. <laughs> we, we, gotta, we, gotta make a, we gotta make another podcast, uh, the Ramp Podcast. And we'll, we'll, we'll start it off with you ranting about, you know, Marvel Avengers, and I'll be ranting about... Uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Mm-hmm. How long... What's the limit on that cast in terms of time? We'll go two hours like our normal cast. <laughs> I don't know. I think an hour ran may be too small. 
Yeah, yeah, same here. <laughs> we, we may have to carry the topic over many podcasts, you know, <laughs> but limited to two hours a day, <laughs> two hours a cast. There we go. All right. Let's take a look at some of the games that we are checking out. As uh, from last week, we picked the games beforehand. This week, it was actually kind of difficult. There was a lot of games being released that looked somewhat decent or somewhat weird. But mm -hmm. let me pull up our demo here. There we go. So this is the first one that kind of took my eye. Enlightened Sentinel. Which is a... We're seeing more indie developers. Seems like they're going for like the open world RPG genre kind of design and this UI raises some major red flags to me mm -hmm. it's well I don't think they ever didn't go for it it's just that it's suicide to go for it mm -hmm. and this is one of the things that we talk about when it comes to aesthetics that part of that is that the UI needs to match the world or the setting that you're going for this yeah does not. Yeah, those those bars at the top are like uh, just programmed in, probably. Mm -hmm. And the the you the other UI elements look like something that was bought from an asset store. I can um, I can almost guarantee you they were bought from an asset store because I may even own those exact assets. <laughs> if not, I I own some remarkably similar ones. Wait, Dungeons and Planes Exploration Styles, you just mean it's open world? <laughs> or they didn't want to call it Zelda? Hmm. Let's see. What? A world filled with surprises and mysteries. Mm, mm, mm. I love the features. Libraries are full of books, and books are full of stories. And stories are made up of words. And words are made up of letters. And letters are made by ink. And ink's made by dye. <laughs> and dye's made by plants. There we go. And plants are made by, yo, know, carbon. <laughs> And carbon's made by humans exhausting air. So it it you exhausting air. There we go. Alright, so this next one it looks kind of interesting. Doesn't have any it has a video to watch. It's a action adventure game that's all about music. So once again, music is the weapon. Alright, Thorn, see you later. Yeah, Thor. Apparently, you have to. Apparently, EDM is the evil bad guy in this one. <laughs> What's a good guy? I think classic rock. <laughs> no, I Rhythm thought it was going to be set play. Rhythm infused third person combat. So I don't know. On one hand, I like combat, but I do not have any rhythm whatsoever. So. This could be a weird one to try. And I'm pretty sure every song in this game will be a D-Mod for me. <laughs> probably. If it's not a D-Mod now, it'll be a D-Mod later, probably. Mm-hmm. But we don't... All we know is that the publisher sold out. We know nothing else about this game. <laughs> <laughs> they sold out. Yeah. That's all we know. And there's no developer, either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see so this one gets on the list because of the name it's the annoying ball game that sounds like a game for Josh mm -hmm. oh good there's three endings and again is one of the, the endings your ball gets less annoyed no he just gets more annoyed hmm is there one where your ball, ball gets mad? Maybe. 
And again, developer says that it will make you annoyed because that's again how you sell a game. Yeah, you 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 tell them why they shouldn't buy your game, and that'll make your game sell, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, just tell them, tell them you shouldn't. You know, just put in there, don't buy my game. Because that worked so well for what was it, Blizzard and several other triple A's? Mm hmm. When they told everybody that? Oh, yes. Alright, so this one, Odie, Odie Housekeeper. It reminds me of kind of like those, uh, the Trapped series or the Deception series for the PlayStation 1, as well as that one about, um, something about your messing with your neighbor. You're setting up traps. And you have to lure the characters into it. Looks like a cute game. Yeah. The aesthetics. I'm sure the aesthetics are there. Uh, don't know why there's a safe cracking mini game. Because there's a safe. <laughs> yeah. It looks I... very plain in terms of the aesthetic to me. Yeah, it is. Hmm? Looks very. It looks very cheap. What it looks like. Yeah. And also, like, the backgrounds don't really m match the foregrounds. Mm. Something tells me this is a game that is probably filled with, like, 50 to 100 levels, and they're all just, like, very slight variations of the one that came before. Very possibly. <laughs> and, of course, there was a Metroidvania, so I had to put in a key for a point of request, Sheepo. Featuring a shape-shifting sheep thing. That is not easy to say 10 times fast. I'm going to say 15 times fast. Mm -hmm. Tight I'm platforming. Ooh, 75 plus hidden MacGuffins. Huh? Could be something interesting. This, I don't like the main character, but the background has a nice look to it. You don't like the sheep? More like a, wait, that's a duck. Looks more like a mouse to me. <laughs> no? We'll see if we get a key for that one. And then, speaking about open world adventure games, we have another one Adventure in Alion. That's <laughs> not a red flag. Mm hmm. That's a lot of bloom right there. Yeah, I, it, here's even just more. Max it out. I, All the bloom. Let's see. i pretty sure. Does this mean we're playing as horses? Can we play as sharks in this game? I sure hope not. After how <laughs> uh, many red flags I'm seeing in here. Can we play entirely alone. Oh, it has smooth drop-in, drop-out, cooperative play online. Is it so smooth because nobody drops in? <laughs> so again, part of the issue is that... What exactly is the gameplay loop? You know, they're describing things, fight enemies, solve puzzles. So, are we leveling up? It looks like... Wait, so the early access version includes one region and two dungeons, so that's everything they've done so far? You know what's great is if you look at the publisher slash developer, it's made by the game production company. <laughs> so they they it's a game it's a company that produces games V. <laughs> yeah. uh. Always the uh, Again, a lot of developers have attempted these kinds of designs, but it's still like this is when we start pushing to like those big it. budgets that and like you need a lot of work to make these games pop. Yeah, it's you know the second you go open world is the second you pretty much die as an indie. <laughs> So here are the games that Shark uh, was interested in. So the first one is Nexomon Extinction. And this looks very much like a Pokemon game. 
<laughs> but possibly better. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a Nexomon. Not a Pokemon, so Nintendo don't sue us. Yeah. Begin your adventure. 300 unique Nexomon. I think the aesthetics are there. It has a very good look to it. It has like that kind of like a cartoon, almost like hand drawn kind of look to it. Yeah. And, you know, it very much, you know, I, I, I think this one's going to succeed. Hmm. I'm really curious about what they mean by dynamic difficulty and how that works. I didn't see that. And like I said, like, you would think the whole Pokemon thing I would, like, fall all over because I love, like, customizable parties, but the Pokemon games have just never managed to hook me. Now, I was super hooked with Red and Blue. Like, I, I loved them dearly. And I played them nearly infinitely. But the the ones after Red and Blue, they... I, I just never really had much interest in them. Hmm. I will put in a key for it. We'll see what happens. Uh. And, and like, for me, I don't know, like, it always felt like it took forever to get to the good stuff in a Pokemon game. And I know people have said there's a huge amount of depth and, you know, there's a lot of post-game content. But, like I said, for me, I don't want to have to spend 20 or 30 hours to get to the good stuff. Well, I, I thought the the whole thing was good. It was just... Uh, I, I think what Pokemon really lacks is like a good, solid story kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, like, aesthetics. <laughs> Alright, let's see. So this next one, Night of the Dead. And this looking like is a survival uh, crafting building game. So kind of like Seven Days to Die. Mm -hmm. And I think it has potential. Maybe not to get as big as... Well, I mean, it does have potential to get as big as Seven Days to Die, but... Like, it has potential to, to you know, really, really be good. Unsure if it will be or not. Mm -hmm. But everything I'm seeing, I'm liking. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't, you know, like, you know, but, like, the real test to this kind of game is getting your hands on it. Yep. And feel, getting the feel for it, but, like, it... It could be great. I like the t the description of the whole tower defense thing. It's really reminding me of the original version of Fortnite. Hmm. Which that again for the people who don't remember the before time when uh, there was no such thing as Fortnite. The original version of the game was a open world tower defense survival style game where you collect materials and resources to then build traps and sections to fight the zombies well that's also seven days yeah but you know the 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 flocking waves of zombies is the blood new moon every seventh day aka mm -hmm. seven days to die so you you have the six days to prepare or six and a half <laughs> and then the the seven the ninth of the seventh you go from, I think it's something like 8 p.m. to like, uh, or maybe it's 10 p.m. to like 4 a.m. or something, with mm -hmm. waves and waves of zombies that know exactly where you are and they're coming to you, and you have to defend and block them and do traps and shoot them and whatever else you can do. Mm -hmm. Could be interesting. I, again, this, it also reminds you a lot of the uh, Barricades game that yeah. we were playing too that you know uh, it's essentially two systems you have the crafty exploration side and then you have the tower defense you know hold them back 
kind of design. Yeah. And it's, it's a very effective gameplay loop when it's done right. Yeah. Alright, well, I will put in the key for it, and we shall see. And then the last game that Shark uh, recommended, this is Immortal Realms Vampire Wars. Immortal Realms, that is a brand, right? I don't know. Because I've heard of that before. It's developed by Palindrone Interactive. Let's see, what have they Published done? by Calypso Media and Calypso Media Digital. I, why is there two different developers by the same name and one of them is just digital? <laughs> like, can they not publish it on non-digital and digital with the same publisher? <laughs> so this, from the description, that it looks like this is a strategy game that also has some late CCG or deck building elements. It, it looks like a, a tactical RPG with 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 you know crossed with maybe a little bit of Slay the Spire or maybe your units and like special abilities or something. It, it, Let's see. It, it's because you have the grid based movement kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, like, and you're sitting there looking at, you got a hand at the same time that have, like, firestorm, mm -hmm. blizzard, lightning, earthquake, apocalypse kind of thing. So the only thing I can figure is, is it's a tactical RPG where instead of having specific moves on specific characters, you have decks for characters on mm -hmm. each, equipped to each character, and you play cards, the cards are your moves for that turn. Huh. And you have a, a tech tree, like a strategy game, and I could only assume that that Maybe it unlocks different cards, or you know, mm. or maybe it you know actually gets you the cards, or you know maybe it gives you mm. that bonuses or something. I don't know, but to me, this is looking very like Total War esque. That you have the strategic layer here, where you're managing your various cities, you're building units, you're you know moving them around here and there. And then combat seems to go into this tactical strategy where your units fight the opponent's units and these cards kind of act as like your special powers or your unique things. Now I don't know like over here, those of you watching this, what this is. The uh, Are these just like bonuses? Are these like passives maybe? Because you can see that where might be that might be like a quest system kind of thing where mm -hmm. you you try to get these optional objectives kind of thing. Let's see. Or maybe it's a a uh, what you would call a system where like it buffs debuffs depending on the map. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Because if you look in the during like each of the these uh, combat scenes or these combat screenshots, there's a unit card in the bottom left. So you're you must be building units in this game. You can see there's stats too. Could be very interesting. Now the weird thing is that I can't request a key for it. I can only request a uh, sponsored key for it, which is very weird. Hmm. No, well, I guess request a sponsored key. <laughs> Total War meets turn base meets vampires. They might unlock the regular request after after it releases or something. Let's see. So here's that. Okay, so here's yeah. the beta. It, it says the regular will be available on the twenty eighth. 
All right. Well, I will keep an eye on for the twenty eighth then, and we'll shall see. Does it say when the game actually releases? Uh, no, it does not. But I can check. One second. Let's see if I can check it on Steam really fast. Well, it's going to be thirty. Be thirty-four dollars at launch. Ouch. It, it, oh wait, it's going to be forty dollars, but they're running a fifteen percent discount right now. So is it available right now? No, you can only pre-purchase it. Uh. It is coming on the twenty-eighth. So you're going to request a key after it comes out. Mm-hmm. Unless you get the other kind of key. <laughs> and I think these are developers behind... Ooh. One of the... Wait, is this from the same publisher? Oh, no. Calypso Media. They did, of course, Commandos Remastered, uh, Tropico, lots of Tropicos, and that Shadows game that we played. Alright. But... Speaking about sequels and all that, let's get to our main topic for the cast. And that is talking about kind of the use and need of sequels. And this began when we were doing our play of Factorio the other night. We got on this whole subject of long-term development. What do studios do from there? And sequels are one of those things that we... And like from our conversation you don't normally see them from the independent space and mm -hmm. part of that has to do with kind of their purpose when we talk traditionally about the game industry in the double AA, a AAA market sequels are important parts about this they are the time to iterate and refine an idea going from you know assassin's creed to assassin's creed 2 uh batman um arkham i forget the whole title there but the first Batman Arkham game to Arkham City and so on. And in these cases, sequels add a lot to the branding and the development of a title. But as we were talking about, you need to kind of justify a sequel beyond just making money. Mm-hmm. And the 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 real advantage to a sequel is being able to build a bigger game, you know, which could be very much a good thing for indies kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. you, you, you have a dream for a, you know, tactical RPG that does this, this, and this, and everything, and, you know, it, it has this long list of things, but there's no way you can make that in three years, you know. you So you have to trim the list, and you have to trim let's say two-thirds of it off and you're like damn I really wish I could get those those other two-thirds and make my true vision but we we just don't have the scope to be able to do it so you make the one-third and everything and then you're like you know what let's make a sequel and then you add the second third into the sequel and then you you make another sequel and you add in the third third and then you have the whole thing your whole vision to actually complete that game but sequels don't have to be used directly I mean you know it, it loses the definition of sequel but the same thing can be applied across multiple games kind of thing it doesn't have to be a sequel kind of thing like you can make a tactical RPG and have all the frame you know a lot of the framework done a lot of everything done kind of thing and then you take and you scrap, you know, you throw away like bits and pieces of it. You throw away maybe 20% of it because it doesn't fit for the next tactical RPG game you have. But the next tactical RPG game you have, mm -hmm. you've already got, you know, you, you drop 20% of your three years. So you've got what? What is that? Like two and a half years? Two and a half years of work already done. Now, you know, towards this new game and now you can make a bigger game you know don't don't just put another six months into it you know you put in another three years or something 
and you make a lot bigger and better game. Mm -hmm. And as we were saying, it, the point of a sequel is that chance to take that foundation, because you're You've already done a lot of the legwork in that case. It's time to now grow things out. And it's often why when we look at major franchises that the sequel is usually the defining game for it. Again, mm -hmm. like, for instance, like with Frax's XCOM, XCOM Enemy Unknown was a really good game. But the sequel is, you know, considered one of the all-time best versions of that kind of design. Because, again, Firaxis knew they had the house built already. It was time to now expand on it. Yep. And the issue, though, as we've said, is that you have to be able to justify the sequel. It cannot just be, we want more money. <laughs> because consumers will see through that very quickly. And I mean, don't you want more money? Everyone wants more money, right? <laughs> I don't know. There's some people that don't. I mean, they, they, they go on and on about never going on to Steam or anything else and being a PC exclusive and being like an itch.io exclusive. I mean, mm -hmm. like, those people don't want any money. No. But they still want to be able to retire from their games, too. Yeah. They, they, they can retire. They're just going to be collecting a retirement about zero dollars and zero cents. Mm -hmm. But they get the the good news is they get that for the rest of their lives. <laughs> so you know they they you know it may not be much money, but at least they get it for the rest of their lives. They're all zero dollars and zero cents. Yep, <laughs> for the rest of their life. And as we were talking about, there's two specific points that we were discussing this on Friday night that I want to bring up. The first is. What happens when you don't go, when you go too far, or if you go too, or if you don't go far enough? Because there's that very weird line that a lot of people feel when it comes to sequels. That on one hand, I don't want to play the same exact thing and give you another fifty, sixty dollars. But if you go too different, then it feels like you're betraying the game, and I don't want to give you fifty, sixty dollars in that case. Unless you play Ubisoft games, new Ubisoft games, <laughs> and then you do want that. Yep. <laughs> and it is a very fine line you have to walk. Because, what was the example? I know we mentioned this example on Friday, or, um, yeah, Friday night, about betraying the brand of the game. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. See, I only remember which one that was. As many games. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Many games have have betrayed the brand and you know you 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 have to build a brand in such a way that it makes sense, you know. I mean and there's many different ways to build a brand. I mean Final Fantasy have built a brand in a very unique way mm -hmm. and the fact is is every one of their except for a few, every one of their games are are uh contained Games kind of thing contain stories, mm -hmm. can get combined gameplay loop and all that stuff. But the you know Final Fantasy two and Final Fantasy three you know three you know are both RPGs. But you know that is that is all that's directly common with them. You know as a mm -hmm. gameplay you know kind of thing. But like. They they still have the same feel to them, and they they still you know, and I think that you know takes place over the writing, you know, the developers trying to you know do something different. But like everybody thinks that like every Final Fantasy is like the same game over and over, and it's like no, like like they you know they have like. Completely different magic systems in in every one of them, which is the reason why, like you know, some people really love one Final Fantasy and really hate another because you know the changes, the differences. You know, like uh, Final Fantasy VII had you know 
I mean, it was more more different than the magic system, but the magic system is the easiest one to to point out. In Final Fantasy VII, you know, they had the material magic system where everybody could use every kind of magic except for, and everybody had their own limit break. So it was almost like a created character <laughs> kind of thing. Create your, you know, it was more about cus character customization because anybody could have anything except for the limit breaks and the base moves and everything. Mm -hmm. Those were different, separating the characters. But the magic was a anybody, you know, create mm -hmm. a character magic-wise. Where 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 like Final Fantasy VIII um, had it to where um, the the you know you would have to go to a specific location and draw out magic, and each of those magic had a limited number of uses, kind of thing. And I think you could still equip them to every character, but they had different uses, and you had to equip and you 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 actually equipped your spells mm -hmm. to your summons. Kind of thing, where like Final Fantasy IX had it to where you know only like three characters could use magic, <laughs> and uh, you know two of them were summoners, you know, and one of them was a black mage, and anybody else could not use magic, and there was you know, and they would just get uh, like magic based off of leveling up, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, with Final Fantasy, you can trace, you know, what elements are kind of held over from each game. Those are, you know, the branding of that kind of design. But, mm -hmm. and I remember the example, it was when we were talking about the new Battletoads game. That the new Battletoads game is not on brand from a gameplay point of view. It, it's lesser than those games. And you'll see people try and argue this with saying, oh, we're just trying to bring this to a new generation. But the problem is that if you're removing what made those things work without adding in new elements, then you're just using the name as a way to, you know, trick old fans into trying something. Mm -hmm. And I did make an announcement... I know the bot was definitely late. I didn't make something in the general chat. I did include everyone about it there. We should probably post that in content updates next time. <laughs> Actually, it did go about 4.36. Yeah, there was an announcement. <laughs> okay, then. The bot was apparently slow again. But... Mm. Oh. <laughs> All right, uh, Pony, see you later. And it's that difference between uh, Battletoads and Streets of Rage 4. That Streets of Rage 4, it, for the most part, stuck the landing of what a Streets of Rage game should be. Yeah, but, you know, it was not the, the, the best of game kind of thing. It was the one of the best we have recently. <clears throat> But I still stick to the the original Streets of Rage actually being the best one. <clears throat> but uh, losing my voice now. <laughs> yeah. And but it was it it's Streets of Rage four is really solid. It just you know there are very clear points where it could have been better. And maybe it will get there because, you know, they're still doing updates to it. Mm. But I kind of doubt they're going to fix the issues that, you know, the big, the, the issues we have. Oh, uh, yes. And again, that's when we start getting into that issue of betraying the brand. That if you want to do something completely different or make it the more kid version or, you know, whatever you want to call it, you can do that. You can't use that exact same branding. That's kind of the problem. Mm -hmm. And we were mentioning this about the use of spin-offs or side stories. You know, uh, again, Shin Megami Tensei being a good example. Mario being a really, really big example. And people are more accepting of, you know, making that amount of waves when they know that's not indicative of the main game in the series. 
And this is also when you can really experiment and, you know, just completely break your design while keeping the branding, you know, as a form of the franchise. Yeah, which is the reason why a lot of people complained about Mario 2. Mm-hmm. Because oh, it really broke the 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 thing because it wasn't actually a Mario game. Yeah. And uh, to uh, Matthew's point about Banjo Thie- 3, wow, I can't say that, uh, that's one of the issues having with Banjo because we nuts and bolts. I loved that game so much, but it wasn't a Banjo-Kazooie game. Mm -hmm. And you have to be really, really careful of just, again, how you label these franchises like that. I think the problem with Paper Mario is that they just keep trying to break what wasn't broken to begin with. (laughs) Yeah. But Paper Mario is a spinoff. It's not Mario. Mm-hmm. You know. And again... It's also not a Mario uh, RPG, either. Yeah, that's another game. <laughs> and again, the mm-hmm. point about... And this is where we're getting like, the two points of brandings versus spinoffs. That... Well, it's not the same, exactly the same. You have to be able to grow and iterate on it. There has to be something new. And new can mean a new story. It could mean in Final Fantasy changing how some of the systems work. It could be any combination thereof. But you don't want to introduce new bad things to your game. Yeah. And to Matthew's point, we said that you don't want a sequel that's exactly the same. You want a sequel that iterates on the original. Mm-hmm. You don't want a completely different game with the name of the, the the other one as a sequel. You don't want to make a racing game called The Racing Game <laughs> and then and then make a you know a visual novel called The Racing Game Two and then make a platformer that's the racing game three. Yeah. People are gonna get mad about that. Just like they don't want you to make you know, like if they made if they just called Paper Mario, Mar or Paper uh, Mario RPG, if they called that Mario Four, mm-hmm. people would have been up in arms. Yeah. Or you know, like Gran Turismo. If you know, Gran Turismo Seven is a first-person shooter and it's labeled as Gran Turismo, you know, people would be very pissed off. <laughs> the racing game too. <laughs> And, again, there's always room to experiment, but you can't have your cake and eat it too in this situation. If you really want to make a completely off-the-wall, you know, never-before-done game systems or gameplay, you can do that. But you can't label that as the next game in your major franchise. Yeah. You, You clearly have to, you know label it a, a spin-off kind of thing. Mm-hmm. If, if you're going to do something different in the same kind of uh, brand or franchise. Brand, yeah, brand mm-hmm. franchise kind of thing, you have to label it as a spin-off kind of thing. And this is the issue that we have when we see kind of people trying to bring back older properties like this, that it is very much a case of, you know, trying to extort goodwill. Mm-hmm. Like, if you just completely remove everything and you just plop characters down, it's, again, we go back to that Marvel Avengers game. Like, it doesn't feel like a game within that property. It feels like yeah. a game that was designed beforehand that then you got the property shoehorned in after the fact. Yep. Uh, it's... I, it's- uh, what was the other? You know, it, it's like the Final Fantasy VII remake. <laughs> it's it's like a totally different game, with just you know, skins draped on top of it loosely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like the uh, PETA version of Mario. You remember that one? Of which one? The PETA version of Mario. PETA, no. And Peter made a version of Mario where, you know, when you got a power-up, you just had a draping, bleeding skin (laughs) of a corpse on top of you. But 
to yeah. Matthew's point, <laughs> your ad sale to about Smash Brothers, that Smash Brothers is a spinoff. It is not meant to be a Mario game. Just mm-hmm. like it would be like complaining about if the Mario versus Mario meets or Mario versus Sonic the Olympic Games, complaining that there's no platforming in that. And again, a yeah. spinoff is not meant to be derogatory. Like with Shin Megami Tensei, people love shit, love Persona, I think, more than they love the main series because they hit that magic, you know, formula with Persona. I think it really blew up with Persona Four, and then they just, you know, took it even further with Persona Five. And this is what I think a lot of people are kind of concerned about with Yakuza Seven, that Yakuza Seven is getting rid of again the majority of the game systems that made the previous six Yakuza games work. But it's not being labeled a spin-off. It is the next game in the major franchise. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a lot of red flags. Yeah. And the problem, and this is where we get to this double-edged sword. If it fails, then people are saying, you killed my favorite franchise, you so-and-so. If it succeeds, they're going to say, great, now I'm not going to be able to get the game that I enjoy because this is so popular, you so-and-so again. Yeah. It's, it's less of a double-edged sword and more of you ruined it or you ruined it. Yeah. Either and, way, you ruined it. <laughs> the kidneys are real, too. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, uh, it's a lose-lose situation. Yeah. Unless, so, again, you properly label it as a spinoff and you assure people that, yes, you are working on a main game. This is well, why it, I, I, was, I was just saying that, that doing it as the main game is a lose-lose situation. Yeah. And, again, this is why Nintendo gets away with this. Because we know there's always going to be a 3D Mario platformer in the works. Just as we know there's always going to be a new Zelda. What was that? And a 2D one. Yep. And they you can know, make... Mario. Mario's the king of spinoffs. Oh, yes. He's well, like the Nintendo equivalent of Barbie. There's like 10,000 rules for Mario. Yeah. Like, 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 I mean, you got Dr. Mario, for instance. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mario is... like, like I'm surprised Game Theory hasn't made out, you know, a theory to if if Mario is more powerful than Superman kind of thing. <laughs> because, like, like, that would be, you know, I think he could be a legit contender kind of thing. <laughs> Especially considering how, you know, Superman hasn't really gotten too much stronger over his lifetime. But, like, like Mario is, rate of growth is just becoming, like, you know, he's getting more and more powers every year Nintendo stays open. <laughs> And the ultimate irony is that there's yet to be a Mario spinoff with Mario being a plumber. Mm -hmm. We still never see Mario in his actual day-to-day job. (laughs) I mean, what would that be, like a a House Flipper version? Maybe. (laughs) House Flipper with Mario? Yeah. Or better yet, we combine that with the Luigi Mansion games, and then, you know, Luigi kills all the ghosts, then Mario flips the house. (laughs) There we go. Nintendo, if you're watching, I just gave you your next uh, spinoff. Mario Flipper. It's like the Property Brothers, but with Mario. Yeah. Actually, there we go. I did it. It's the Super Property Brothers. There we go, people. It's the Super Property Brothers. (laughs) Now I'm going to get a suit from both Nintendo and, uh, what is it, uh, the Learning? HDTV, I think. HD, whatever it is, yeah. Uh (laughs) Now I'm really in trouble. My mom would probably love that game because she watches tons of that. She loves Property Brothers. <laughs> and when we talk about sequels, at least in the AAA side, the problem, I think, for a lot of these companies is that, one, you are being, in many cases, games aren't made with sequels in mind. Not in the same vein as, you know, something like with Mass Effect. Bioware knew with the first Mass Effect that they were going to turn that into a trilogy. For a lot of companies, it's still very much up in the air. They have to see if that first game succeeds. 
And this is, again, why the first entry in a franchise is usually the smallest in scope. Because you're just trying to get the damn thing built and hoping people like it enough. Mm -hmm. well, the minimum viable product, what they're aiming for. Yeah. And then if it works, then you're free to then put in all the crazy ideas and grow things out. The issue is, is you know, they they a lot of them tend to focus on the minimum and not the viable, and then you get these games like uh, what was that uh, one, uh, the Iron Man looking one, uh, mm. the Iron Man open world. Not just cause, right? No, no, no. They had the suits of armor. You had all the suits of armor that you could customize and everything. Hmm. It was huge, and the backlash was huge. No, it was an Iron hmm. Man game. It was a game. Just all the characters. Anthem. Yeah, Anthem. <laughs> you know, they they definitely went towards the the minimum on that one. Yeah. They focused on the minimum. Not on the viable. Yeah. But, I mean, that whole game development was a train wreck happening in slow motion, if you read the stories about it. I think it was about 20 or 30 train wrecks happening simultaneously. And a Hindenburg, too, crashing down. Yeah, there's at least three of those. Yeah. And the problem from that AAA space, of course... For, like the publisher they just want as many sequels as you can do because a sequel is a known element if you know that you know game 2 sold 1.2 million copies you can assume game 3 will do somewhere around there but mm -hmm. again very few franchises are set up almost like evergreen to just you know keep pumping out games again Mario is a really solid exception to that because there is no story to Mario you know, how many times has he saved Princess Peach by now? Well, there's more there, There's more, more story to Mario than there is to Dark Souls. Mm -hmm. There's just more lore to Dark Souls. Well, I don't know if there's more lore to Dark Souls. I mean, there's, there's a whole lore of, of Mario out there on the internet. <laughs> there's a lot of lore for Mario out on the internet. So, like, there's know, a maybe lot of lore for everything. <laughs> yeah. But... So, Maybe even Mario's got that, too. But the other side of this, of course, is talking about things from the independent space. Because this is where things get very interesting. Because indie development is not the same as working at a AAA studio. And, again, that comes with, bo with both pros and cons. I thought it was exactly the same. Well, I mean, indie yeah. developers can just make Fortnite in a day, right? Well, they can do it in an hour if they skip lunch. Mm hmm. <laughs> that, that is. Well, again, it depends. There's plot, and then there's the. Ag or plot and lore, and then there's the actual story that happens over the course of the game. So, like, something like God of War, the plot is, you know, Kratos having problems, you know, identifying or, you know, handling his kid, and then the actual story is what goes on when they go on their little adventure. Yeah, I still want to play Data War. <laughs> All right, maybe we'll come to the PC at some point. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, bring this back on topic with the independent side of things. That indie developers very much can work on a title for as long as they want. There is no you know shareholder demanding game gets released. They can make whatever game they want, and. Again, the major pro about this has led to some of the most artistic and you know uniquely driven games that we've seen anywhere else. The last ten years alone brought so many amazing titles to the forefront that would never come from the AAA. But yeah, I, I want to take a little divergence here mm -hmm. and you know point out that you just defined basically what an indie is: somebody who doesn't have stock coders. There we perfect. <laughs> because you know, you know, some people call some studios indie, and they have stockholders. You know, it's like no, that's that's not that's not that's not indie. Mm -hmm. Indie means you make your you're independent. You make your own decisions. 
Yeah. Indy doesn't mean you have stockholders that make you know, a lot of decisions for you. <laughs> that's, that's the opposite of Indy. Mm-hmm. And it's not size. I mean, generally, when you have stockholders, you're larger, but, you know, mm-hmm. size is not direct, you know, you know, you know, relevance to if you're independent, right? <laughs> it's if you're actually independent. And if you have stockholders, you're not independent. <laughs> And <laughs> again, the reason or the reason why we see so many unique stuff in the independent space is that there are no shackles. There's no constraints when it comes to making their games. But the problem, of course, that leads to another very nasty question. What do you do after the game that you just spent five to ten years of your life on? Hopefully you didn't spend that long because if you did, you're probably not going to earn the money. <laughs> the game fell. Unless, of course, you're a Factorio. <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't spend, you know, five or ten years making the game until after they released it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was after they re- after the initial release, you know, into early access that they spent that time. And again, and this is why we brought this up while we were playing Factorio the other night. That Factorio is one of those games like Dwarf Fortress or Europa Universalis or anything like that where it doesn't appeal to everybody, but there is so much in those games for their respective niches that it becomes, you know, your your ultimate game, that game you can play every day and never truly get finished with it. But the problem again is how do you follow that up as an independent developer? Because yeah. there, and this is again one of the sad truths that there is no such thing as that one game that's going to maintain a studio forever. And when we say forever, I'm talking literally forever in this sense. You know, the next fifty to sixty years. Eventually, well, I mean, well, there there is the potential of that, but you know, the the chances of you hitting that mm-hmm. is is astronomical. You know, I mean, Hearthstone's heading towards that, you know. Uh, several other games are heading towards that, but, like, WoW's heading towards that. And mm-hmm. But the odds of you being the developer of the next WoW or Hearthstone or, you know, or whatever other game is next to none. Mm-hmm. But it is physically possible, but never count on it. Do not count on it. Do not plan on it. You know, plan for the potential to be there, but never plan on actually doing that kind of thing. Plan on stuff that is feasible, you know, with a possible future. You know, the the future could be infinite, mm-hmm. you know, but plan on the immediate. And then, you know, and maybe prepare for this second dose kind of thing. But don't, don't just plan on. Yeah, I'm going to have this go forever. Because mm-hmm. that's that's a that's a pretty much guaranteed way to fail. That's a pretty much way guaranteed because if you're planning on forever, mm-hmm. it's pretty much that that first game is going to be forever because uh, you're you're not you know it's it's going to fail. Oh yes. And it's going to fail forever. And with the more popular independent games that we've seen, you know, stuff like Stardew Valley, Factorio, um, with some other really big examples, like even something like Disco Elysium, that these are games that were designed to be the dream game for somebody. And while they are certainly great, there's always that question as to what comes next, because a studio for the most part, can't live off of a single game. And for some developers, they run into that problem of, what do I do now? And this is where we start to really see that dividing line between a hobbyist and a developer, or more specifically, an actual game studio. If you are by yourself... You can make whatever the hell you want. You know, if you don't care about making money, if you don't care about, you know, a market, you know, you be you. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. But 
when you're suddenly now having to use your, you know, your, the money from your games to, you know, keep your house or make sure your family has food, the the question becomes a lot more serious. Yeah, I I have the inverse problem to where it's not like, you know, I I made a you know really hit game that's all ready to go, and uh, what do I do next kind of thing. It's it my my issue is is I have like thirty games I want to make. <laughs> Which do I make next? <laughs> mm-hmm. And again, and adding more to that list every day. <laughs> of course, everybody has at least five to ten different dream games, and then that list will grow. What, like every minute for every day, depending upon what inspires you. Well, I don't know about dream games. I think everybody has one dream mm -hmm. game, and then everybody else has a ton of other games that they also want to make. Yeah, and. For me, and this is one of the things that we've seen, and this is when we brought up studios like Clay and Supergiant Games, that when like the independent space started to blow up in, we could say maybe like 2009, 2010, and then grew over the last decade, a lot of people expected indie developers to go again the sequel route, you know, and then Mimil was going to go from the buying of Isaac to the buying of Isaac 2, Stardew Valley, Stardew Valley 2, and Again, so on and so forth. But instead, what we've seen out of independent developers, which is unique compared to the AA and AAA space, is that they focus more on the studio branding rather than the game branding. And the reason why I brought up Clay and Supergiant is that they are the perfect examples of this. If you look at Clay's entries, we went from Don't Starve to what was it? Uh, Don't start together. Yeah, it was just even that was a spinoff and that grew to its own thing. We went from Don't Starve to Invisible Ink, Invisible Ink to Hot Lava, Hot Lava to Auction Not Included, and now Auction Not Included to Driftlands. And there is no line that you can draw from one game to the next from a mechanic standpoint. You look at Supergiant, going from Bastion to Transistor to Pyre to now Hades. The studio, in of itself, is the branding there. And on one hand, it is a little bit riskier, because you can't necessarily rely on your knowledge and your first fan base to follow you along. You know, if you create a fan base of uh, deck-building roguelike fans and your next game is a Dwarf Fortress-esque style game, there may not be a lot of carryover. But... Yeah. The other I thing have a theory behind that. Mm -hmm. I have a theory that, you know, I mean, this isn't good for 100% carryover, but I think this is a high percentage of carryover. I, I think there's really two core types of games. Mm -hmm. Right? There's Twitch-based action games, which would include stuff like, you know, Devil May Cry, first-person shooters. Uh, it would technically include beat 'em ups. It would uh, it would include uh, um, side-scrolling shooters. It would, mm -hmm. you know, include a lot of different games. And then you have the 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 non-turn base. You know, the the non-Twitch base, which would be stuff like tactical RPGs. Strategy games, as long as it's not, uh, you know, pro in in uh, uh, StarCraft, you know, where you have to do mm -hmm. micromanaging, and then that that's going more towards the 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 Twitch based. You got you know your tactical RPGs, your your turn based RPGs. You've got your <laughs> you know action RPGs. You've got your you know although action RPGs is going closer to the Twitch, you know, kind of thing. You've got your your uh, you've got you know all those things, and like there's, you know, there's definitely you know points where they cross into each other, kind of thing, and some that are just straight on the gray line, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you try to go one side or the other side of things, you're going to have a lot of you know a decent bit of 
carryover in your 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 uh, your audience because people who I think people who like Twitch based stuff are going to more like Twitch based action stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think people who like the you know more thinking games are going to like more thinking games kind of thing. Like it's it's it seems more like a personality thing. It's not like they can't cross over into the others. But I think it's harder for somebody to cross that line because, like, I find myself to be more the thinking, per, the thinking games kind of thing. I like the, you know, the the strategy, the the tactical RPGs, the RPGs, you know, that kind of thing. You know, and you know, I think Josh is more on the action side because he likes the, you know, plat the platformers, the the. Rogue likes the action. Rogue likes he likes the uh, mm-hmm. you know he likes a lot of the you know re- reflex based games kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah, and I think as you said, like if you can keep to kind of what your audience, you know, what attracted your audience to you in the first place, and then you know experiment in that space because it is a very wide space. Again, oh, the. Very. You know, just between you know RPG, you know, there's only one kind of RPG, right? Yeah, only one. It's Final. F- no, it's Call of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> and the other uh, point I was uh, going to make is that the advantage of kind of that franchise branding is that it makes your studio stronger in terms of its marketing, and you can then use your studio as marketing points, like. Uh, I think it was your last show, the show before that, we said as any developer, you don't want to include your name in your cinematic trailer if nobody knows who you are. But if you're, you know, Red Hook Games who made the hit Darkest Dungeon, you can bet they're going to include that as, like, maybe the first or second scene in the Darkest Dungeon 2 trailer. Yeah. Or if you're Clay. Or Supergiant. Yeah. If, if you get to the point where you're known... Absolutely, put your logo and everything of your studio right at the beginning. But unless you have a big fan base and everything already, mm-hmm. do not put your logo at the beginning. Put it at the very, very end, yeah. basically, or or one of the end parts. You know, I mean, you may want to put the wish list on Steam or whatever at the very, very end. But like, whichever, it, it needs to be in the end part. There are several things in the end part of a trailer, but you want your 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 tra- your your name to be at the end part of your trailer, where if you're well known and everything, put it at the very beginning. You know, I know I made that mistake in my you know last three trailers that I put it at the very beginning. Nobody knew who Nexus Games is. Still doesn't know what ne- what Nexus Games is. Does anybody here know what Nexus Games is? <laughs> No. Sounds no, like a, nobody. Sounds like some made up company. It, I think it is. Because <laughs> I made it up. Yep. <laughs> and we see again from the independent space that when you build yourself around that kind of franchise name, as long as you can keep, again, to your fan base. And I think this is another major point that I want to bring up that another way to kind of hurt yourself is to go completely 180 with your games as in okay the game that made us famous is a turn-based rpg so now let's make a first person physics driven shooter and then after that let's make a racing game and the problem is that some developers can do that they can switch tracks very easily but it's a lot harder than it sounds. Because from a development standpoint, every genre is different with its methodology. You can be the best platformer developer in the world, that doesn't mean you know anything about realistic racing sims. And if you're the best realistic racing sim developer in the world, that means you know nothing about stealth-based games, or turn-based RPGs, and so on. And this is where you also get into that problem of what happens when you try and 
almost you're trying to fix what wasn't broken with a franchise. And actually, this is a really good segue, because it brings back that discussion we had about Phantom Doctrine. That the first Phantom Doctrine game is a Cold War era XCOM like. The, you now, you would assume that with a sequel, they would try and do more with that. No, the sequel, and it's being labeled Phantom Doctrine 2, is a third person stealth Hitman game. Now, it could turn out to be a really amazing third person stealth uh, uh, Hitman game. But as we said earlier, it's a, you're, you know, you're pissing off the, the fans versus you're pissing off the fans. Yeah. And the rest of point, like, everything you just said is is in that second category, is in the category of Thinking Man's game. You know, the, mm -hmm. the top-down puzzle game, the, the tactical uh, RPG, the, mm -hmm. the card game. I guess the web game is. I, I don't know. I <laughs> could only, you know, I could only assume that that's in that same kind of thinking kind of category. And I think that would be good. The reason why you can't build a fan base is because you don't have a fan base. You know, like, like, you have to get a hit. You have to get a hit to get a fan base. So you have to build a hit game to get a fan base. You know, like, you can slowly grind out a fan base through making many games that that particular fan base enjoys. But no, you need a, you need a hit to build a fan base. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you don't need a fan base to build a fan base. If you have a fan base, that fan base will just build a bigger fan base. That's that's how it works. It's a snowball effect. But you're you're you know, like getting a fan base to build a fan base, if you're going that way by slowly, you know, making games, then you're gonna, you know, sell a hundred copies of this game, then a hundred and ten copies of this game, hundred and twenty copies of this game, and 200 games later, you're at like a thousand copies sold and you're still nowhere and you're you're a hundred years old at this point in debt. You know, you, you can't go at it that way. You have to you have to get a hit. And, you know, getting a hit is very, very hard. Yeah. Or else everybody would have a hit. No, it's easy. And Everyone can do it. You know, hopefully my my current game that I'm working on will become a hit, and uh, it has the potential to become a you know a massive hit. Mm -hmm. No, you can't just decide to make a hit, but there there is things that you can do to to go that direction. You know, and you know that gets into risk mit uh, mitigation, which the one of the you know I mean one of the things that you know, I seen fell completely on my last game was the aesthetics. The, you know, aesthetics is so important to becoming successful and becoming successful means you, you got to hit at least in the, the minorest term kind of thing. You know, I mean, be, you know, like if, if you became, if you broke even, then you became at least a big enough hit to break even, which means that you now have at least that minimum amount of fan base that will keep you supported, basically, as long as you don't screw things up, and it'll help you build into a larger one, and, you know, but, like, aesthetics go a long way, a long, long way, and I, I really hate that, but aesthetics mm -hmm. is so important. So, like, with my current game, my goal was let's go as close as we can get to triple A level of aesthetics. And, you know, if triple A were to make a 2D game kind of thing, it would probably be about the, probably a little bit better than the game I'm currently making, you know, graphics wise. But, you know, aesthetics wise. But, like, we should absolutely crush them in every other category, you know, gameplay and everything else, because triple mm -hmm. A isn't known for innovation or good gameplay loops or anything like that. They're 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 used to, you know, we'll make a game, a minimal viable product, if it succeeds, we'll keep on building onto it and make it better kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
But of course, if you build too much onto it, then the whole thing just collapses, as we saw with Dead Space. And mm -hmm. turning that from a pretty good survival horror game into a co-op shooter that they expected, what was it, like 5 million copies to sell in order to justify us keeping that series going. Well, that wasn't really building onto it. That was destroying parts of it and, you know, adding new parts, changing, mm -hmm. yep. rather than building. They destroyed a lot of stuff, and the, the fan base really hated it, that they destroyed all the stuff mm -hmm. that they loved. And, and it was, a, a lot of ways, a completely different game with the, you know, skin on top of it. And still using the branding of the major franchise. Mm-hmm. Instead of being clearly labeled as a spinoff. Mm-hmm. And one of the big things, I think this one needs to be said, if you're doing a spinoff of a game, it should not be costing more, or you should be expecting to get more sales than the main franchise. It can happen, but you can't just say, okay, if Mario as a platformer sells 10 million copies, let's do a Mario cooking game, and it should hit at least 20 million copies. Yeah, what would that be? Cooking Mario Mama? Cooking Mama Mario? Cooking Mama's Mario. <laughs> There's a few uh, D mods, I think, right there. <laughs> and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I guess while I'm trying to come up with anything, any other parts about sequels that we didn't touch on? Well, we, we, we touched on, on it, but we didn't go into depth about, you know, making a sequel that isn't a sequel. As in, you know, building a game like a tactical RPG or whatever genre mm -hmm. and then build in another game that is a tactical RPG you know but different mm -hmm. okay. we we hit on that but we didn't go into any kind of depth on that mm -hmm. you want to go into more depth on that one okay <laughs> thank you <Matt. laughs> yeah so we've seen developers especially in the kind of the hobbyist stage or like starting out that they'll just keep releasing the same genre of game almost to the point that it's just you know different flavors of the game that they worked on before um mm -hmm. that game that we played on wednesday night that citadel game that's supposedly the fifth game in a series from by like, looking it up it's based off a fourth game which is pretty much the same thing but with you know quality of life improvements and yeah that's, that's not a different game that's a that okay. is a huge red flag right there. And that, we didn't mention this, but here's another very important pro tip. Don't release a game calling a sequel if it's merely an updated version of a game that's already out. Especially if you're trying to sell them both at the same time. That is just a huge no-no. Mm -hmm. If you saw with that a Slain game, that Slain got a re-release as Slain Back from Hell. And when they released that, they took the first game off of Steam because they don't want you to play the crappier version of their game. Mm -hmm. And that is all right. But when you're, if you just keep making the same game over and over again, this is, I think, where we see kind of from an issue from a lot of the hobbyists that there's no improvements. It's basically, okay, our first platformer was a 10-level, you know, run and jump. Well, our second game's going to be another 10-level run and jump, doing the exact same things. Maybe instead of a blue background, it's a green background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to do that kind of thing. You want to have... You want to, you know, as an indie, if you were to do something like that, you'd want to put significant change. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wouldn't, you know... You know, what I would do is, you know, like we made Chromasia, you know, a tactical RPG. Now, sadly, we can't do this with this particular one because of the custom engine. Well, we could, but, you know, we probably won't because of the custom engine and everything. But what we could do is is take and not make Chromasia 2, but make another game, let's say, you know, Project Toaster. You know, because that's originally what that game was going to be. We could make Project Toaster, which is also a tactical RPG, and we could take and scrap, you know, pull out, you know, 
probably about 20% of the game that is only, you know, that applies to Chromasia kind of thing and pull that stuff out and then and and Pro Toaster was a lot bigger scope. It had a lot more systems. It had like a you know, it had a stealth system in there. It had, you know, collectibles um, and stuff. It had, you know, exploring on the world. You know, it had several other uni unique mechanics and everything that would go in there to replace that 20% and new art to go replace it, you know, new many things to go replace it, new music, new, 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 a lot of things. We would just have a lot more solid base to give us a head start into going that way. You know, it's, it's, you know, you know, they, they say that the first 90% is the, you know, easiest and then the last 10% is the hardest part of the thing. Well, we would be taking out the last 10% and probably we, we'd take out the the other 10% off of that uh, initial 90%. So we'd have that 80% to go forward with and build, you know, not just another different 20%, but we'd build a different 20% as well as we would add probably another 50 plus percent to it mm -hmm. and take it to the you know, be a different game completely. Like, like, like. Basically, it would be like if you would call Chromasia the same as Disgaea. It would be like going from Disgaea and then taking what we had made in Disgaea to make uh, um, what's that game we were talking about? That tactical RPG with the the planes and tanks and everything. It was very much like War Group, but one War Group. Advance so, Wars. Yeah, it was like we take this what we had made with this guy and then we you know take part of it and we make you know advance wars mm -hmm. so you know it's it's you know you know or maybe vice versa maybe we made advance wars first and then we took what we made from advance wars and made this guy with it you know completely different games they they play very differently and everything they they have tons of differences they're not even the same game but if, if you look at them, a lot of the things are the same between them. And that would be the 80% that we would take on to the next game kind of thing. So it's making a new game with a lot of the stuff that we had already developed for the last one kind of thing. You know, although the you know current one is a card game, so it, you know, doesn't. But if we ever make another card game, like... like Maybe after Project Triad, maybe we'll make something like uh, Slay the Spire or, you know, Monster Train kind of thing. Because a lot of the mechanics, systems will carry over kind of thing. But, you know, because it is still a card game. And, you know, or we might make something like the the Vampire game. We looked at the weird game segment. You know, there, there's... There's no limit, but basically what it would do is it would give us a head start. Yeah. It wouldn't be a sequel, but it would give us almost the same advantage as making a sequel kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But again, the advantages you're saying there is that you have a you have the foundation already in mind. You've made tactical strategy games. You've made deck builder games. You can use that knowledge to do something else. And well, not just the knowledge, but you can use some of the code and, you yeah. know, assets and, well, not the, the the code assets, not the visual assets. Yeah. And but. there are cases, I think here's another very weird point. There are rare exceptions when a developer goes completely in a 180 degree direction from what they're normally known for, and they make something that is legitimately good. And the example that I always turn to is Victor Vran. Victor Vran was made by a developer who was known for making city builders. They never touched the ARPG or action game genre before, and Victor Vran was a really good game. Did it, you know, beat Grim Dawn, Diablo, or those other titles? No. But coming in with that kind of fresh eyes on the genre, it afforded them the chance to do something that nobody else saw before. And it is possible to have that advantage of, you know, switching games to that extent. But Yeah, but the issue is the audience yeah, exactly really and the risks. Mm -hmm. Because again, if you are known as a city builder 
and your next game you are trying to make Doom Eternal, it could be a very hard sell for some people. Could be. It's going to be. It's 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 extremely risky if you already have a fan base because mm-hmm. a lot of your fan base, I'm pretty sure a lot of their fan base got pissed off because they made Victor Ramped. Could be. And it could also be why they're not making a sequel to it. Because even if Victor Rand did really well, the question then turns to how many of those fans are going to convert into fans of their city builders? Yeah, and there's not going to be very many. So when they, if they make another city builder, then they're going to get the, the you know, the complaints from the people who played Victor Rand. Mm-hmm. And you know, like it. I feel like if if you want to, you know, be on both sides of that, you know, coin kind of thing, you know, the 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 thinking side and the 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 Twitch reaction side. I feel like you need two studios. Mm. There's nothing. You, there's nothing says that you can't do two studios. You know, like I could have Nexus Games and <laughs> and you know Games Nexus. Yeah. I could have Games Nexus. That's totally not a YouTube channel. No. But but you know, could have you know both of those, and you know one of them could make a- the action Twitch based games, and the other one can be the the more thinking games kind of thing, and that's possible. But I wouldn't do that until you have one of them established. Mm-hmm. You know, take one, build it, establish it, then you know maybe build the next one. You know. But, you know, and be careful about that because you run into a lot of things, you know, mm-hmm. lots and lots of issues because you, you, you don't want to neglect your first one. Yep. That, again, is that risk when you start having, if you start diversifying so much that people start asking, okay, I followed you because you make really good first-person shooters and you haven't made one in the last five, six years, you know, when are you going to get back to my game? And you'll see some developers, quote unquote, wisely, you know, attack their fans, saying, "Well, we're doing this now, so why don't you just, you know, enjoy this game or get out?" Because again, as we said earlier, you know, it's always good to tell your fans not to play your games. Don't you people have phones? Yep. Don't you people like uh, first-person shooters? <laughs> don't you people like turn-based strategy games? Mm-hmm. And again. It's always that there's definitely a greater topic, I think, for a future show about, you know, expanding yourself as a game developer. That, you know, once you've gotten that first game, you know, how do you grow and keep things going? And this is something that a lot of people tend to struggle with. It's something that we see from a lot of YouTubers, that they'll get burnt out on, you know, what kind of made them famous, or they don't want to do it as much. And then they'll, tr- you know, throw everything against the wall to see what sticks or what they can do easily, and they end up upsetting a lot of their fans because what brought people to them ch- to their channel is no longer happening. Yeah, but you know, you also don't want to get into a hole to where you're only making one genre of game. Mm-hmm. Unless you are really good at that genre, like again. You know, something like Paradox, who makes grand strategy games. I, I would argue, even if you're really good at it, you don't want to get into that hole. Mm. Because if you get into that hole, then you're going to burn out. Yeah. Like, no matter how good you are at making grand strategy games or tactical RPGs or whatever, like, like you get, it's, it's hard not to get burned out making, you spending three yeah. years on a game, you know. Let alone the try same. To spend, rest of your life making that same game just different you know versions of it you know i have a story there i spoke with a travis baldry who worked at runic who made torchlight and i spoke with him and the co-founder they went on to do a rebel outlaws i think it was or rebel galaxy i forget the name of it and in that interview they said we've been working on arpgs for like the last 10 years we don't want to make another ARPG right now. Like, we're done with that. We needed to go do something else. And yet, what Shark said is 100% true. Eve, it's that old adage of, you know, if you eat nothing but cake, you will eventually grow sick of it. I had a similar experience when I went to GDC in, I think it was 2010, 2011, 
and I decided in my infinite wisdom to get a cheeseburger every day of my every day I was there. And by like day three, I was like, I can't eat this anymore. I need something else. And so now, now we need the the new channel, game, uh, cheeseburger wisdom. There we go. <laughs> or infinite cheeseburger wisdom. Mm, infinite cheeseburger. There we go. Somebody make that. <laughs> <laughs> And yet, it is tough to make, and again, this is that issue for a lot of developers that it, we mentioned this with like Kerbal Space Program, Factorio, that Factorio officially hit 1.0 this past week. So that game is done. And I can guarantee you that not one person who worked on Factorio is thinking to themselves right now, you know what? I think we should go make Factorio 2. Let's start on that right now. Who's, who, who wants to join me? Or a very close facsimile to to mm -hmm. Factorio. Yep. And it, there's I always that. Want to make something different, like you know, like uh, like probably like a you know card game or. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they won't decide to make a cyberpunk game based off Triple Triad. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's uh, you know multiplayer. Yeah. And again, this is what we always talk about when it comes to kind of the business and management side of the game industry. It's tough to survive as a business making video games. And, mm -hmm. and I guess this will be safely extreme. You have to be, you have to, you know, be original enough to keep uh, experimenting, but you can't be too original that you then upset your brand. <laughs> Yeah, like you, you have to uh, to uh, keep on going, and you you have to like you know. I remember with Chromasia is like I got so burned out after the first year, and it was mm -hmm. it was just a slog after that. Like I was like. The only thing that carried me to the finish line was sheer willpower, and you don't you don't want that, you know. Of course, I did it to myself in a lot of ways because, like you know, we were we were light on testers, and things needed to get tested, kind of thing. That you know, and I went through and I played the game in I think it was Alpha Five, and I put probably. 500 hours into Alpha 5 when it was in super broken and everything, super incomplete and playing it over and over and over again trying to find out every you know game design thing that I could do to it you know at that stage and I, I burned myself out because after I did that mm -hmm. every time I looked at it looked at a piece of art for it, every time I looked at the game, every time I looked at anything like we I felt, you know, like, I, I really don't feel cringe, but, like, you know, you probably noticed that from the streams. <laughs> but, but, like, I felt so much cringe inside every time I looked at anything to do with Chromasia. Like, like it, 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 it literally sink, sickened to me to look at it. Like, it's like, oh, let me work on a new... It'll let me work on a piece of art for it. You know, this part needs to be redone. Mm. And I, I open it up, and it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, because I've seen so much of it, I was tired of looking at it. Yeah. You know, I boot the game. Oh, you know, like, like, and since the game has been completed, I still have not even played my own game. And that was what, 2000, mm -hmm. July 2018? I haven't played it since it got completed. I haven't, you know, well, Technically, I have, but I haven't played it. Played it. I, I played it for a stream, you know, that I played one or two levels of it, kind of thing, and that was it, kind of thing. <laughs> Although I don't know if that was a finished version or not, but I know it didn't include all the post-finish updates for sure. Yeah. But like, it it was so draining on me to look at it, look at the art, you know, look at just one tile from it. It just was so draining, and it took me six months to get over that you know six months of not working on it or anything to to get slightly away from that and you know 
I was going to play it all the way through during that move I did. You know, you remember that move I mm-hmm. did, Josh? Yeah. But I didn't because it was around that time when the idea of a remake came up. And it was like, well, if a remake's coming up, I don't want to play it all now and then burn myself out before I start it. Like, that wouldn't be a good idea. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass for now. We'll, we'll, you know, I'll wait till, you know, we, you know, work on it. And I have worked on it a little bit here and there just in spare time. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting it, you know, I'm excited for it again, you know, and definitely interested in taking it, you know, farther than what we did originally. But like, I'm I'm so afraid to to burn myself out on it, which is you know, and I I have the same fear on Project Triad. That's the reason why, I'm like, when we do testing and all this other stuff, like you remember when you played it on, like we we played it. I played a game with Josh just to teach him how to play it before the stream, since there was no onboarding. Mm-hmm. I was his onboarding, mm-hmm. and then and then when we got to the stream. I had everybody else play with you and not me play because I don't want to burn myself out. You know, I was so afraid of playing it. You know, like whenever we do dev chats and everything and play Project Triad, which is based off of Triple Triad, Rat's Tale, mm-hmm. you should come and join my Discord as well as everybody else. But, you know, the, the, you know, when we do the, the, the play test and everything on the, the, uh, the dev chats and everything, although we haven't done one recently, but when we do them, I don't play. I don't play it unless it's um, unless it's you know unless we have an odd number of players. If if you know because I don't want somebody to you know have to wait five ten minutes until somebody finishes before they get to play a game and then somebody else you know does that. I'll come in as the you know last person you know to even out it otherwise as long as it's even I won't play <laughs> and I'm trying to keep my play to a minimum because I don't want to burn myself out and I want to really enjoy the game rather than burning myself out and not be able to play it after it's done kind of thing yep. because I want to play the hell out of it after it gets done you know what I mean and I want to you know be there for you know like the updates and everything and like you know be still really into the game <laughs> and I just don't think I can be if I if I'm too close to it when it's so incomplete you know I, you know because like when it's incomplete it, it's so much rougher and so much harder to get into mm-hmm but I don't know how we got onto that, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I think uh, let's begin to wrap things up as we're about to hit the two-hour mark. So for me, when it comes to kind of knowing when to work on a sequel, as we've said, you always have to think about how to justify this sequel from a gameplay or a storytelling perspective. I know uh, with uh, Chris Park from Arkin that he didn't want to work on AI Wars 2 for the longest time because he didn't want to seem like he's just copying or, you know, trying to just exploit people's love of the first game. And when the time came to fall into a sequel, he thought, okay, what's everything that I wanted to do in AI Wars 1 or all the complaints I got in AI Wars 1 that I can try and fix and improve. And that's kind of how they justify the sequel. Mm -hmm. And, again, if you're just making the same game, and I mean literally, you're just making the same game, maybe you're adding in new levels, but it's still the same gameplay loop through and through, that's not really giving you the chance to grow. And, like we said earlier, you can run that risk of just burning out if all you're doing is making the same, you know, platformer for the next four or five years. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, like, that's what got me to do the remake of Cremation, because, like, I don't want to burn out on it, but, like, you know, like, there's a lot of feedback that I got that I mm-hmm. want to incorporate 
and everything and all kinds of other stuff and that's what the remake is you know like a lot of people just said make Chromasia 2 it's like no that doesn't work because like the story has a hard end mm -hmm. and I I want to keep it that way because it's there intentionally that way so I want to make sure that it stays that way but that doesn't mean that I can't remake it you know which would be the equivalent of basically just a massive massive update kind of thing like like a game changing update because it'll be basically a completely different game although it'll still be the same game at the same time but it'll be a completely different game at the same time too it, it, it's weird how it's like that you know how it can be completely different but yet the same you know it's got the same feeling it's got a lot of the same stuff it's just you know, it's got a lot more stuff. It's got, you know, things are changed, tweaked, you know, where, where pain points were, you know, aesthetics are completely replaced, you know, or maybe not completely, but maybe 90% or something like that. And like, it, 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 it feels the same. It, 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 it's like, but it feels completely different at the same time. It's, it's, it's safely a street is what it is. All right. I guess any final uh, note about sequels from you? Um, well, I I would say that sequels, in whatever term you want to call them, like the you know, like you make a tactical RPG and then you make a different tactical RPG that's not under the same brand. I don't think I I don't know if that would be considered. That's not technically a sequel, but it, it kind of is too. <laughs> What I would, I would consider that maybe a non-brand sequel because it's not in the, it doesn't fall in the same brand, but it is kind of a sequel to your original thing. So like, it it's it's you know it's a completely different game, but at the same time it's the same game, like like Final Fantasy, you know. And if you make a you know. The issue is, is I don't think you could pull off a Final Fantasy brand thing in these days. Mm. Like, like they've had many years to establish that, and I think if you were to pull that kind of thing right now in these days, it would probably fail horribly. And people would just think you're ripping off Final Fantasy too. Yeah, that too. <laughs> but like, you, you would. I wouldn't suggest calling all your games Final Fantasy but you could do the same thing Final Fantasy does just don't call them all Final Fantasy you know don't call them Final Fantasy 1 through 8 15 million call them you know you know Fantasy Fantasy and Final Final and and you know Fantasy Final and Final Fantasy well you get copyrighted for that one but you know all the others are fine you know <laughs> Call another one Fantasy, Fantasy, Fantasy. There call another one Final, 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 Final. And then you can call the other one Final, 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 Final Boss. And, you know, then Josh will play that all the time. <laughs> all right. But I think with that, let us wrap things up for this week. As always, if you have a topic for us to talk about in a future show, let us know in the comments below. We will be back Sundays around 4 for 30 EDT right here. You'll find links to our respective discords in the description down below. Be sure to join them. And I guess anything you want to end on, Shark. I'm pointing out to Rastel, be sure you enjoy it. My discord. <laughs> All right, everybody. With that said, I'll be back later tonight for our regular game streams and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we send the RN science of games. Until next time, take care.